I've got in my museum a 15 and a half foot python snake skin. If you look at the south end of that snake skin, it's got a couple claws attached to a little two inch bone going up inside the snake's body. We've got them in our, we've got it in our museum, okay? Textbook says, see boys and girls, this is a vestigial structure. The boa and the python have these little tiny claws. Do whales or snakes have back legs? You can see that they don't. Yet, both animals have vestigial hip bones and leg bones where legs may once have existed. This is a lie. No, that is the truth. I think we can prove that, and I will in a moment. This textbook says they have reduced hind legs, rudimentary hind legs of a python snake. You've got to be kidding. Those little claws are used in mating. Once again, a vestigial organ is one that is a diminished remnant of whatever it once was and no longer serves its original function. And sometimes you can appropriate a vestigial organ for a different function, which is why only male constrictors have these residual claws. Note that vipers and colubrids and other types of snakes don't have them. And the reason they don't is because they obviously don't actually need them to reproduce. Constrictors don't really need them either. They're pretty weak and feeble anyway. So eventually, even they will lose these, like the rest of the snakes already have. Okay, the snake doesn't have any arms, and he can't talk and say, uh, scoot over, honey, okay? Ironic, isn't it, that the preacher, a biblical literalist, points out the fact that snakes can't talk. Remember that the reason that creationists are so desperate to discredit evolution is because they're trying to defend a fable about a talking snake one who was cursed to crawl on his belly all the rest of his days, implying that before that curse was levied, I guess that snakes could walk? Yet the preacher is now arguing against that. Strangely, he is here denying that there was ever a time when snakes had legs, even though his own scriptures make clear that they did. There was a time when such folklore used the words serpent and dragon interchangeably, and either one usually had legs. Even though it says Leviathan has legs, the Bible calls it a dragon and a serpent. The book of Isaiah also refers to Leviathan as both dragon and serpent. The book of Revelations says that the devil is a dragon, albeit one with seven heads. And the same verse also calls him a serpent, but one that it can apparently stand, because it's described him as standing on the beach. Um, Genesis never says that the serpent in the garden is a dragon, but it does imply that it might have had legs at one point because he was cursed to crawl around on his belly for all time. And Genesis never refers to the serpent in the garden as the devil either. There was no option for him to grow a half a dozen extra heads and then go stand on the beach. Uh, that's one of the ways that we know that the serpent in the garden can't be the same character as Satan. The serpent was cursed to crawl on his belly for all time, but the first time we see Satan mentioned by name is in a story chronologically after this one, and he's described as walking around and chatting with God as if they'd never had a falling out. Most versions of Jeremiah and Ezekiel translate dragon to mean monster, but the, you know, the description could be talking about a snake, but there are also times when the Bible mentions serpents and does not equate them to dragons. So it appears that the serpent isn't always a snake, but is sometimes a very serpentine creature, which may or may not have legs or wings. This is one of the earliest depictions of a dragon, and it turns out that most of the references to dragons in, the, in medieval literature, whether they're in scripture or uh, any other document, are referring to snake-like things like this, and many of them refer to a specific group of lizards that are most closely related to snakes. The most famous example is St. George slaying the dragon. Depictions of this beast vary wildly, and some of them give it mammalian features like external ears, as shown here. Uh, sometimes they have fur, sometimes they have bat's wings, like this one does. And notice that the bat's wings are not big enough to fly with. They're apparently still developing. We can consider this an evolutionary transition. Yeah, uh, and we'll see more of that in a moment. Uh, the, this sort of chimera uh, is another evolutionary impossibility. But it usually looks about like this, like a very big lizard. And can you see the tongue darting out? Because that's important, remember that. Here's a slightly more realistic relief from the 16th century showing that uh, this really is nothing but a big lizard. And I'll superimpose that with another realistic rendering to give you a, the scale. Um, 
Again, we see the tongue darting out, indicating that this is a varanid, a giant monitor lizard. This is a family of very large and dangerous uh, long-necked lizards from the tropics. And th these include the Komodo dragon. Uh, it's important to note that St. George was not in Europe when he encountered this dragon. He was in Libya, which is in North Africa, and they actually do have lizards this size. This is a Nile monitor the species George would most likely have encountered. All monitors are mildly venomous with an anticoagulant saliva. These grow about as long as I am tall, but as we said, uh, you know, most people didn't uh, grow that tall at that age. So a, uh, if you looked at a suit of armor from that period, you know, these were not big guys. So St. George, probably a foot shorter than me. So a better illustration would be this Malaysian water monitor. These things are seven feet long, enormously powerful, and eat children. Uh, lizards of this size or bigger are man-eaters. As an amateur herpetologist familiar with these things, I've had a few of them as pets, and I do not recommend it. <laughs> but I can tell you that these are remarkably accurate renderings of monitor lizards, except that the monitors, the varanids, are the only lizards that have the forked tongue, like a snake has. And it's only supposed to have two prongs. Maybe something like this is, you know, can escape detection when you just look at it at a glance, or maybe if you're not trained to study such things. But we see this motif being repeated again and again and again as one artist copies another artist. And they don't, and it's like somebody didn't bother to say, you know, that's only a tongue and it should only have two prongs because they keep adding prongs to it until it doesn't look like a tongue anymore. What does it look like? Bingo. Then we get to this thing. This was obviously done by somebody who had never seen one of these lizards and didn't know that it was supposed to be a lizard. And that's definitely not a tongue coming out of its mouth. It could be a bale of hay, but I'm, I'm guessing, you know, maybe he's like smoking an entire carton of cigars. But uh, it looks like he's got Godzilla breath. And I'm taking that guess by the fact that he's also against a backdrop of flaming destruction. So... Um, and then we look at what that led to. Here we have another giant monitor, even further exaggerated. Now it's bigger than people, and it has both a tongue and fire. And I don't know if you can see the small point, but it, it, wrong about the third line of that text, it should say that it is both a, it, they calls it both a serpent and a dragon. And there, there were varanids this big uh, in Australia around 20,000 years ago, but of course this artist didn't know that. Uh, this artist drew it with the mammalian features, again, the external ears and such, because he didn't know it was supposed to be a lizard. And apparently this one is afraid of drowning, and that's why it's wearing water wings. Um, <laughs> but again, you know, this is, this is the, the barest beginnings of those wings. And comparing that to that other image, we see that it'll develop into slightly larger wings and, of course, become full and flight wings later on. And the, this is how dragons evolved, in a sense, in our folklore. And the classic image of a fire-breathing dragon actually began as a tongue-lashing lizard. And we've exaggerated, extrapolated that to give flight to a race of gargantuan gods of fire and lightning bolts. Once upon a time, serpents had legs, and not just in folklore either, but in real life too. And all that any of them have left of those legs now are those puny claws in male boas. This has nothing whatsoever to do with walking on land. It has to do with getting baby snakes. Yes, these vestiges did once have to do with walking on land, and we have proof of that, though it may be a bit confusing. We often hear that the glass snake is not a true snake, that it's one of several species of legless lizards. Well... Technically, cladistically, snakes are lizards too. They're a subset of the order Squamata, a taxonomic category that means lizards. Of all the different categories or varieties of lizards, snakes are the most closely related to mosasaurs and monitor lizards, which also have those forked tongues. Legless lizards don't have forked tongues, but varanids and serpents do. They're very similar to each other. But if a snake had legs, it should still be recognizable as a snake. We know that because paleontologists have actually found fossil snakes that still had legs. Tetrapodophus ampleticus is a 120 million year old four-legged snake. Except, look how pathetically tiny those legs are. Here is a snake with four fully developed legs with all five toes on each foot. 
Not the one claw and a single bone that pythons had, and yet these legs are already vestigial because they're so small that it's impossible to walk with them. And clearly they were not created this way. This is not an intelligent design. Those legs were obviously once used for walking, but not anymore. These are mere vestiges now. It may be only capable of coupling during mating. The rest of the time, they just get dragged along for the ride. Now, because Tetrapodophus represents the very earliest emergence of snakes in the fossil record, we would expect that it be very similar to the other lizards from which it evolved. And it is hard to tell this one apart from the very snake-like lizards that used to exist in the same lineage way back then. True snakes are serpentes in the order Ophidia, based on the Greek word for snakes. If Tetrapodophus is a lizard, then it would be outside of Ophidia, just outside of it, but still in Pythonomorpha, after the split between what would become Mosasaurus and what would become snakes. So even if it's not quite a true snake yet, it's so close that it's a transitional species anyway, and has been deemed the Archaeopteryx of squamates. So once again, somebody's real dumb about their snake anatomy, or they're lying to your kids trying to spread their theory. I will agree with the preacher here that someone is still being really dumb about snake anatomy and misrepresenting the facts in order to proselytize an indefensible belief. But that someone isn't me. I know snake anatomy pretty well, I think. It's funny how we think of snakes as cursed because they don't have legs or hands and they don't have eyelids. It's not possible for a snake to close its eyes. They don't have ears either. They're all completely deaf. They can only hear through vibrations reverberating through their bodies. And they smell using a stereophonic forked tongue. And some of them also have a sort of heat vision that apparently works like synesthesia. Yet despite all of these disadvantages, there are so many more species of snakes in the world today that they are arguably cursed to be the most successful of all modern reptiles. If we look within the clade Ophidia, we find a number of stem snakes becoming the form we just described, beginning with the most primitive form, Dynalesia, the terrible Elysia, a three meter long proto-python. Then we have Metsoyidae, the very primitive snakes, and these are the pythons and boas. And then we have Najash rio nagrina, a true snake, but with legs. Except that again, they're only tiny vestiges, and it only has the back legs. The front legs are gone completely. And this trend evidently continued for a while, because when we get into Serpentes, which accounts for all the modern snakes except for constrictors, there are two more species, Hasiophus terrasanctus and Pacaracus problematicus, that both have tiny little hind legs and no front legs. Now, why would all of these different species of ancient snakes only have such tiny remnants of one pair of legs, and it's always the hind legs? Those little claws are used in mating. That's probably why. It's as good a reason as any. But it still means that they were already vestigial, even when they were complete legs with five toes on each of the two remaining feet. Having those even further reduced to no more than a pair of bones with one claw at each end, that all the other snakes already gave up as unnecessary means that they're even more vestigial. This textbook shows the coccyx, the human tailbone, and a Discover magazine, and it says, that's all that's left of the tail that most mammals still use. Humans have a tailbone that is of no apparent use. I was in a debate in Huntsville, Alabama against the president of the North Alabama Atheist Association. He got up in front of God and everybody and said, folks, I've got proof for evolution. Humans have a tailbone they no longer need. I said, uh, Mr. Patterson, I taught biology and anatomy. I happen to know there are nine little muscles that attach to the tailbone, <clears throat> without which you cannot perform some valuable functions. I won't tell you what they all are, but trust me, you need those muscles. I said, now, if you think the tailbone is vestigial, I, Kent Hovind, will pay to have yours removed. <laughs> Bend over. <clears throat> Thinking hypothetically for a moment, if the human coccyx was a remnant of what were once full-length tails, then in our evolution there was a time when our post-anal tail was our primary locomotion. So you would expect it to be anchored down pretty well to a whole lot more muscles than are left connected to it now. And later in our evolution, when the importance and the function of the tail was entirely lost, and the size of the tail reduced to the point that you can't even see it anymore, then there would only be so much you could cut off without interrupting pre-existing muscle connections to other things. Critical thinking, this book says, 2005 edition. At the end of your backbone is a coccyx, a few small bones that are fused together. Could the human coccyx be a vestigial structure? Or is it the start of a newly evolving structure? That's thinking critically. 
They give the kids two answers, two options, both of which are wrong. There's a third option, you know. Maybe it's fine just like it is. Notice they don't give that as an option, do they? The teacher in this case didn't give the kids any answers. Instead, they were given two different questions, yes or no questions, allowing a minimum of four options. One of which we already know was clearly and demonstrably correct, but it isn't the one that the preacher wants to make believe. If we want to inspire the kids to think critically or at all, then we can't use the preacher's option because that's really just avoiding the question, trying not to think about it, but just to say that it is what it is, as if we shouldn't want to know how or why it is what it is. Maybe it was designed to support your colon and support your lower back for posture when you sit, and five or six other things you can read your Gray's Anatomy about. Okay? Maybe it was incidentally designed for that purpose through generations of the deterministic process of natural selection. There's certainly enough evidence to support that, but we cannot assert any hypothesis that is not supported by any evidence whatsoever that cannot be tested in any way and can never be falsified either, at least not in any way the faithful will accept. Because were it not for the reality denial of blind faith, then no one would believe in this miraculous creation ex nihilo anymore, because that already has been sufficiently disproved otherwise. They say, aren't babies born with tails once in a while? No. Well, that baby's got a tail right there. No, he doesn't. It's not a tail. That's just fatty tissue. There's no bone, no muscle, no cartilage. It's not even lined up with the spine. It has to do with the way the baby develops inside the mother. There's fat around the nervous system to protect it until the bone grows around it. And extremely, generally, the, the fat is resorbed into the system as the baby grows and develops bone. But on extremely rare occasions, the fat is excluded outside the body like a big wart. So what you do, you cut it off, sew it up, put a diaper on the kid, and send him home. It's just nothing like a, it's just like a wart. That's all it is. Cut it off. It's not a tail. According to this study, people can be born with either a pseudo-tail, such as the preacher just described, or they can be born with a true tail, containing fat, yes, but also connective tissue, central bundles of striated muscle, blood vessels, and nerves, all covered by skin, and it can move and contract. However, it also says that bone, cartilage, notochord, and spinal cord are all typically lacking, that there has only been one reported case of vertebra in a human tail. And that's because it's not an atavism. Instead, it says that a vestigial tail describes a remnant of a structure found in embryonic life or in ancestral forms. During the fifth or sixth week of interuterine life, the human embryo has a tail of 10 to 12 vertebrae. By eight weeks, the human tail disappears. The persistent tail probably arises from the distal non-vertebrate remnant of the embryonic tail. The human tail arises from the most distal remnant of the embryonic tail, which is why the vertebrae are not included. Although they say it is possible that mutations resulting in increased upregulation of the WNT3A gene may result in retention of the embryonic tail in human newborns. This one says the coccyx is a small bone at the end of the human vertebral column. It has no present function and is thought to be the remainder of bones that once occupied the long tail of a tree living ancestor. My textbook says every human embryo has a long bony tail, the vestige of which we carry into adulthood as the coccyx at the end of our spine. So that's not a lie. The human tailbone is also an evolutionary vestige, obviously, or that would be obvious if you knew what a vestigial trait is, which you evidently don't. They told me when I was a kid, man used to have a tail, but he lost it because he didn't need it. I thought, didn't need it? Have you ever thought how handy a tail would be? <laughs> Have you ever come to the door with two sacks of groceries? <laughs> Man, wouldn't that be nice to be able to grab that door and walk right in there? You could drive down the highway and hold that can of Coke and tune the radio knob all at the same time. <laughs> Lost it because we didn't need it. That's a lie. Remember that in the evolutionary perspective, also known as reality, humans didn't lose our tails as soon as we diverged from the other apes. The lack of any tail is one of several defining characteristics of apes, all of which also describe humans. Apes are a subset of old world monkeys. Apes and modern cercopith monkeys both evolved from an older group called Propliopithecoidea. And according to this study, we diverged from cercopiths roughly 30 million years ago. Now, fossil evidence indicates that, our, that the closest thing to our ancestors at that time were Egyptopithecus, described as an ape-like monkey, followed by Proconsul, described as a monkey-like ape. But it already had no tail at all, so it's been a long time since human had tails. 
The type of prehensile tail that the preacher is describing only exists among New World monkeys, which arose in South America. They developed prehensile tails, such as we Old World monkeys never possessed. And prior to that split, 30 to 35 million years ago, the common ancestor of both Old World monkeys and New World monkeys were parapithecids. And they had tails that they could use for balance when jumping or climbing, like a cat does, but they couldn't use their tails for anything more than a cat could. In fact, one of the defining characteristics of Old World monkeys, which also describe people, is that the tail is reduced, either in size or in function, or both. It can be a useless appendage, or some Old World monkeys have no tails at all. So if any human was born with an atavistic tail, like, even a long tail like Aegyptopithecus had, you wouldn't be able to hold anything with it or do anything with it. So not only would you not need it, but you couldn't use it, and the only thing it could do is get in the way. So while there is a lot of evidence for evolution, vestigial human tails in newborn babies were never a part of that. Vestigial human tails in embryo is part of that.